שבוע טוב, and we are in a special, special, special week, special, special uh, פרשה, פרשת בשלח, the splitting of the Red Sea, and uh, Shabbat Shira, the Shabbat of the song. So what are we doing this week and what do we have? This is a week of huge miracles because we are talking about the biggest scale miracle ever happened, which means millions of people witnessing a miracle that never been seen before, never seen after, and experience it on the level that also is unprecedented. And what, what do we mean? Like when we, we are talking about, uh, it says, the uh, sages are saying, A simple maid, which means somebody was not sent to school, she doesn't know how to read, she didn't learn poetry and not prophecy, or something like this, she was not well versed by anything, just as a, an example, saw on the sea experience a higher prophetic experience than Ezekiel had when he had his vision on the river, as it being said in chapter one of Ezekiel. So we are talking about something on, on, on a scale that we are talking about millions of people like 600,000 men from 20 to 60, and at the same number probably, statistically, of women and children. And then, you know, we're talking about more between two to three million people experiencing that awesome experience that was not just seeing a physical sea split. We're talking about a prophecy. How do we know? When we read in this parasha, the song of the Red Sea, that you can see it as a song, the way it's written in the Torah itself. The Torah itself is written by columns. Whoever have seen the Torah, there are columns. However, when there is a shira, a song, then they, it's not written as columns. The words are more separated, or we, let's say there's a lot of space between each sentence, between each verse, which means there's a lot of white and less black of the writing. Now the sages say that the white in the Sefer Torah, in the Torah, in the parchment symbolize the light of the Creator. The black symbolize the vessel. When you have so much light, so much white, and a little bit of, that means there's a space that the light of the Creator comes in. We know very well that a song is this kind of a space, because when people sing or listen to music, they are connecting to a place which is much higher than when you learn or read literature. There's a different, totally different place. It's like what's more, what's more popular, music or reading books? It's like music, especially today that it's so accessible for music. So when you see somebody walking on the street and they have those earphones, most chances they're listening to music and not to somebody reading a book. Right? So, and also, uh, when you listen to music, you can deliver a message of experience and feeling much easier than when you write or when you read poetry or any kind of description. Music is something of a much higher level, according to Kabbalah, than, than writing. Now, when we are talking about the song itself, the words are very clear. The skipping into the uh, story of the uh, song itself, I'll explain why is it so important for us. Uh, <clears throat> okay, we're talking about Exodus chapter 15, verse 1. And it says over there, as Yashir Moshe of Israel, then says Moses and the children of Israel were singing that song, and then the whole song of the Red Sea is being described over there, right? W what are we doing over here? How could they sing it together? There was no karaoke technology at that time to read the writings in their phones or in the heavens, right? That was not invented yet. How all of them knew how to sing it word by word with the right melody if they just cross the sea 
And that is to explain to us there was over there a prophecy, a prophetic experience of a whole nation. Otherwise, this chapter 15 in Exodus is the biggest lie in the history of mankind. Why? Saying that they sang it together, that's a lie. Okay? And you know, if you're dealing with Israelites and Jews, selling that idea, you know, when was the lie introduced? If it is a lie. Like, you know, you come to some to a whole nation, especially Jews, say, you know what? Your great grandparents, they sang together on the sea, all together. You know, what's the response? They didn't tell us, you know. How come you're coming with this uh, nonsense? Uh, it's very hard to sell a whole nation with it. It's much easier, like in many religions. Somebody had a dream, and he comes and shares his dream with other people. Okay? My word against his word. He can't say you didn't have a dream because, you know, you haven't been there. Here we're talking about this was not a dream. It was a reality. It was an experience. People really been there. Okay, this is what we're talking about. So have being there, experiencing that, this is the this is the main the main issue. Okay, so when it says and Moses and the children of Israel they were singing that song, they arrived to a place of prophecy, and the question is, how did that happen? And in order to understand it, you need to know the background. And what is the background about? We explained it before. The whole, you have to see it in a broader, bigger picture of the tikkun, the correction of all of mankind. We're talking about after the sin of Adam, the world is getting into more darker and darker and darker place. Things are much more cruel and negative as the generation passed. We went through the uh, generation of the flood. We went through Tower of Babel. We went through Sodom and Gomorrah. Things are getting worse. And now we are at the age of the Egyptian empire. That was the empire of darkness and black magic. Controlling people's minds and hearts through fear and dark magic. Nothing else. So where are we? That's not a nice place. And therefore, the Arizal explained that Rabbi Ezekluya, the Israelites had to go to Egypt in order to collect all of those holy sparks that were sucked in to Egypt because of that dark place and then elevate it to a higher place. And all the terrible experience of the slavery in Egypt was part of the cleansing they had to go through. That's why the Torah calls Egypt the iron furnace. What is the iron furnace? It's like you take the ores of gold or silver and it dirty it's it's mostly dirt so what do you do you put it inside the oven the furnace and you heat it to the highest temperature what happens the dirt gets burnt the dirt is is becomes a, into ashes and the pure metal leaks to the corners and then you can collect it and that's why Egypt was called the iron furnace the dirt of the of of the mankind has been burned through the misery and the suffering in Egypt. However, the result was that finally you could collect the holy sparks, and that was the exodus of those holy sparks out of Egypt. But it's not that; it's even more than that. It's not just about Egypt and the Israelites. It's the history of mankind, because as we said, the whole thing was about delivering the consciousness of hope, love, mercy, kindness, that this is the true, the true part, the true dimension of reality, and evil, selfishness, and pain is an illusion. The message of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is about that, nothing about that. The problem is, Humanity, you know, it is you try to talk to somebody about there's a better world, there's a better life, there's a better, everything could be better, everybody, everything could be greater. It's like, and people don't listen to you. Years later, they say, how come I didn't listen to you? Trying to instill hope in the heart of somebody, it's not always easy. 
usually people have the tendency to believe to darkness and pain more than believing in happiness. Look at the media. What's, the, what's being sold better? Calamities and disasters or good things that happen? You know, how many times in many, many countries people say, let's start a newspaper that is only telling good. Doesn't sell. People will prefer to buy newsletters of doomsday, calamities, pain, and misdoing. Nothing, nothing new about it. But during the time of Egypt, it was much, 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 much more dark, negative, painful. Mankind believed in pain. As we said many times, the religion was a religion of evil. It was dark magic. People never believed they deserved to be happy. They were subjects. They were uh, stepped on. They were abused. They were taken advantage of. They were just nothing. Just tools to, for others to use. Very few people were rich. All the rest were subject to slaves. Even if they were not called slaves, they were slaves. The king could take from you everything. He could put on you any kind of, of blame and execute you, take your children, take your daughter, whatever. That's, a, that's the way life was. Not too long ago, and there are still places on earth that there's no justice, that people have no right to be, to own their own possessions. Now, to deliver such an idea, it's not easy. The same way you see people that they believe they're supposed to be miserable and victims forever. They talk like this, they behave like this. They, their life is just about that pain. To bring a person to a place that he believes that he deserves to be happy and, and powerful, that's not easy. It's like the whole world is in, into it right now about all these campaigns of people standing up and saying, like women that were abused and people that were abused by this and that, government, politicians, it's, it's, it's all over. In order to be abused, you need it takes two to tango. The person who's being abused has to agree to it and agrees to it because they mentally you agree that you're not supposed to be happy. A person that is into happiness, it's a, you can't abuse that person. They don't believe what well, you know, you're trying what? You want what? There's no way, you're kidding. Right? So to deliver to the world this idea, this is the biggest change in the and turn in the history of mankind. And that's why the Exodus made an impression on the history of mankind like no other event. No other event. Now, as the Israelites get out of Egypt, we're talking about the last parasha, parasha Tbo, the tenth plague and getting out of Egypt, if you're looking at it, Till that moment, 10 plagues, the Israelites are like statistics. Like, uh, no, there's a, how do you call it? You know, they're like uh, standing there passively watching it, but they're not involved. The plagues are being brought by Moses and Aaron on the Egyptians. The Israelites are just witnessing it. Okay, even later on, towards the last plague, when they are being asked to slaughter the lamb, and put the blood on the doorposts and the lintels. They're still doing it because they were told so. Now, it's a week. They're already walking in the desert. Why a week? Because we learn that being in such filth as Egypt, it's, it's a mental filth. You know, always being upset and negative and afraid. This is filth. You cannot be upset and negative and hateful and be free and be happy. It's like either or. It's like you have a thermos. If you want it to be productive, you cannot put hot coffee and an icicle inside and expect it to stay. It's like you cannot put in one human heart hatred and love. Being upset and being creative. It, it doesn't work. It's like two different things. You, in order to do that, you have to take responsibility. And taking responsibility means that I know and I recognize what's wrong about other people's behavior, but I don't let that control me. It doesn't, it doesn't take over my heart. 
it doesn't take over my mind because it doesn't take away that faith I have that I was created like every other human being in the image of God and therefore nobody but nobody has the right to take it away from me now reaching such a place is not that easy getting out of Egypt out of that filth it means you're going through a withdrawal the Israelites were not so happy the Zohar says in this parasha as the Israelites were walking through the desert they were broken into pieces like in withdrawal it's like before that in Egypt they were into one mode survival now says the Zohar they get out they start to realize what they experienced they shock it's like you see this vision of the uh, allies taking over Germany and going to concentration camps you don't see people dancing you see in the pictures and in, in the videos videos you see people in shock standing there with lifeless almost it took them a while to realize what they went through they could not be happy in the during the liberation they were too much into abuse too much into abuse only later on so the Zohar says that as they were walking through the desert angels had to go around them and sing to them to make them recuperate they had to go through a healing process of coming out being victims and slaves and just dirt being being uh, uh, handled as dirt for so many hundreds of years for generations and realizing you know I'm a human being and I'm somebody and I have the right to love people and people love me Th this was impossible but it takes a while so as they get out of Egypt the process is just starting so why why just after the 10th plague we didn't get the Torah on Mount Sinai we were not ready and that's why the result Rabbi Zatoria and the Zohar explains it's like you have to go through a process and the process had to take seven weeks which is called the counting of the Omer only after the counting of the Omer after 49 days have passed on the 50th day we could have connected to the true universe the universe of endless light love and realizing there's nothing but that that all but that is it's like it's illusion whatever is not about love and happiness and creativity and happiness it's it's not real experiencing that we had to go for, through a withdrawal you know when you go through abuse you get kind of addicted to it because you get obsessive compulsive thoughts of abuse and you see that so yeah one person is abused by being in pain because they're sick and another person is because it's a mental pain because of other people's behavior but it's all about abuse it's abuse of what about the darkness that it's all about giving us that negative attitude that you become obsessed about it you just worry about it and worry about it and you're painful about it you feel like a victim you're miserable you make other people miserable because misery likes company it's like how come you dare to be happy when I'm miserable instead of saying wow I like to be like him you know what can I do to be like you very rare so after the seventh the on the sixth day after the Exodus that's the day of the splitting of the Red Sea says Rabbi Isaac Gloria that on the sixth day it was like almost the first week is complete for the time for skipping to the next level and skipping to the next level you needed to go through the splitting of the Red Sea and what does it mean to go through the splitting of the Red Sea it means that if you look at it we're reading the in chapter 13 verse 17 that's the beginning of the parasha as Pharaoh is sending the nation away and God did not direct them through the land of the Philistines now just geography 
the Israelites were in Goshen. Goshen was in the northern part of Egypt. If you look at the map, you want to go to Israel, you have to cross the Sinai Peninsula, the northern coast, and in three days' walk, you are in the gates of the Promised Land. Who was there at that area, which is called today the Gaza Strip? At that time, it was called Pleshet, or in English, Philistia, coming from the word Pleshet. Pleshet in Hebrew means the land of the invaders because it was occupied by, it's called the nations of the sea. They landed, they came from, some say from Crete, some say from Cyprus, and they occupied that part, the southern shore of the land of Israel of today, the area which is kind of bigger than what is today the Gaza Strip. Okay, it takes three days to go over there. Very easy. There's no obstacle, really obstacle, it's just sand dunes. You can pass it easily in three days. How come it took 40 years? So it says that God took them through the desert, which means if you look at the map, you had to go south all the way, like six days walk to get to the Red Sea. Why do you have to go turn around? Because they had to experience the splitting of the Red Sea. Why? Because in order to deliver that consciousness of positivity and love, you have to understand that it's all about miracles. Miracle is what makes a human being a human being. The, because otherwise, you're just a beast. People are born, beasts are born. People grow up, beasts grow up. People get married, beasts sometimes get married. Some of them, some of them just, just bring children, somehow. Okay? Some of them educate they, they, uh, their children, and some of them not. Okay, whatever you see about human beings, you can find in the animal world. What makes us special? It says, What's a human being is better or more than a beast? Ein. Ein means nothingness. What do I mean nothingness? So let's go into the story itself. The Israelites are walking in the desert the pillar of fire walking in front of them during the night and the pillar of smoke during the day. Just following the pillars and meanwhile they're going through this healing, realizing we are free, we are free. We are free to care, to love, to dream, to hope. We are free to be whoever we want to be. Nobody has the right to kill us, to destroy our lives, to take away our children, our money, our homes, whatever. It's a, we're walking towards a new world. And that state of mind is starting to settle in. It's the first week. First week of overcoming the Egypt within each one of us. Okay? Now, it says, chapter 14, verse 1. By the Be'er Hashem and Moshe Lemor, and God spoke to Moses, saying, The Be'er of Israel, Yashur, Yachanu, talk to the children of Israel, and let them go back and camp, or park, in front, Pi Acherot, that's a place that we're camp camping, Ben Migdol, Ben Ayam, just in front of the sea, Tachanu Ayam, just camp there in the, in the sea, and wait. Wait for whom? Ve'amar Paro, Livnei Israel, and Pharaoh will say, they are lost because they don't know where to go because it was the place they were. There was a sea in front of them, mountains from the right, mountains from the left, and a desert behind them. Now Pharaoh said, that looks like Sagar Alem Amidbar, they are closed, they are cornered. It says, and I will make the heart of Pharaoh stronger. He will forget all the ten plagues he experienced. You forgot? <laughs> you try all over again? and he will chase them. The whole thing of the splitting of the Red Sea with Pharaoh, that was a setup for Pharaoh. The Pharaoh had them, and Pharaoh chased after them. And Mitzrayim, Egypt, will know that I am God. Why do you have to prove to Egypt? You have to understand, we are talking about that as long as you come out of Egypt, 
and you still feel like a victim of Egypt, you're still carrying Egypt inside, inside, inside you. You're still a victim. Because as long as you carry the hatred and the anger and the negativity and the upset, you're not free to be the person you're supposed to be. It doesn't matter if you're right. You can be right till the end of the generations. You're still a victim. And a victim means that you cannot be free. You're not free. You're not free to be the person you really want to be. That's very important. That had to go through a completion. By God, the Melech Mitzrayim, so then, after God says it to Moses, we are now in verse 5, and it was told to the king of Egypt that the nation ran away. And the heart of Pharaoh, turn over, change. What did we do? Why did we send the Israelites? It's like, he totally forgot what he went through. They took 600 chariots and of dark magic because that was their forte. And so on. And they are chasing after the Israelites. Okay? And then verse 10. Read it carefully. In most of the translations to English, it says, approached. If you know Hebrew, that's not what it says. If it would be approached, it should be karav. In Active tense, but here it's hikriv. Whoever knows Hebrew grammar, it's in hifil. Hifil means to activate. Ufaro, he didn't approach. He made somebody else approach. Say the commentaries. By Pharaoh coming closer to the Israelites, they see Pharaoh, and now the first time in history of mankind. The people step step up. By what? Everybody starts to pray. When is that you pray? When you believe that somebody listens to you. When believe you believe there's somebody who listens to you and loves you because you are his child. That never happened before. Pharaoh approached the Israelites or brought the Israelites closer. Yoshorish is Karov, brought them closer to the Creator. It was the first time a whole nation is stepping up to the stage of history saying, we are here and we believe we can ask and we will receive because we were meant to receive justice. We are meant to receive good. And there's no way that Pharaoh is going to kill us. All here on the sea. That never happened before. Never. People could not do that because they didn't believe. They were told that all the gods, they love the elite. That God loves only Pharaoh, only the nobility, only the rich, only the powerful. He doesn't love you. You're nothing. You're dirt. You don't deserve it. Can you imagine that every person believes he can pray to God and he will be answered because, just because, because you were created by him and you are his child, like every other human being. Do you understand what a deliverance is that? It's never been before. That was the whole story. What the whole That's the biggest split ever in history. The people believe they have a place. And the Israelites are, and the children of Israel are yelling to the Creator. But wait, it's not over yet. Then, you know, they still have remnants. It's only six days after Exodus. They come and say, verse 11. They say to Moshe, This is like so Jewish. There were not enough graves in Egypt. You took us to die in the desert. This is like this cynicism that is so common to Jews. 
הלו, זה הדבר שדיברנו על מצרים, verse 12, we told you in Egypt, it's better we stay slaves in Egypt. <laughs> we told you. Now you're saying, why didn't you say it yesterday? When you're free. Say so you're going back, you're still slaves. Vayomer Moshe el Ha'am, verse 13, chapter 14. This is very important. Moses says to the people, Al tirao, do not be afraid. You stand there and you see the salvation of, the, of God. Asher he, whatever he is going to do to you today. And then verse 14, Hashem ilachem lachem, God will fight for you. Ve'atem tacharisho. And you keep silent. This is, the Zohar says, one of the biggest secrets of, that you can ever, ever learn. Because, Vayom Hashem el Moshe, we're now in verse 15. And God says to Moses, Ma titzak elai? What are you yelling at me? We said, Pharaoh made everybody yell to God, save us. And you yell to God only because you feel that God is on your side. If you feel that God loves only the Egyptians and only Pharaoh and only the oppressors, you don't pray because you don't believe. Not just this. You read the, 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 the Greek mythology or the Babylonian ones. Don't pray to the gods because you're going to, you know, you make you go on the radar and you're going to be punished. They don't like you. You're born wrong. You're born to be abused. You're not supposed to stand up for your rights. You're not supposed to be happy. You're not supposed to connect to God. Who are you? You don't deserve it. You're full of filth. You're nothing. By the way, this is religion still in many places. Okay, because that's a very in very powerful tactic of controlling people, making them believe they don't deserve it. Okay? So it says, what are you yelling at me? Verse 14, verse 15, sorry. The bear of Nasal Visao, talk to the children of Israel and let them travel. And the Zohar is asking, travel? Traveling where? They were camping on the sea. They were mounted from the right and the left, and the pharaoh on the back. Travel where? And the Zohar says, travel to the highest levels. Travel, travel upwards. Raise your heart, your mind, your soul to the highest point. Connect it to the place of the creation. That means like the highest level of faith, of connection. Connection to what? To the origin of creation. To the kettle. To the kettle, which is the seed of creation, which is what about? As the Ramchal, the Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato says, the purpose of the creation is lehitiv, to do good to the creatures. When you connect to that place, the seed, everything is possible. Because from now, from that place, only good can sprout. How? You have no idea. Why? Why should you know? If it's going to be great, you'll complain about it? Are you going to bring God all kinds of suggestions with the logic that got you into trouble? Or you want to get out of the box and connect to that place that all what is good is coming to the universe? If you connect to that place, there's endless resources, flight, fulfillment, ideas, creativity, innovation. That's a place everyone wants to connect to. And when it says, do not yell at me, it says, let them travel, says the Zohar, travel to the upper, to the highest level. They were ready. They were ready to make this quantum leap. And that is what we're talking about in this parasha, the ability to leap upwards beyond everything you can perceive, anything you could ever understand before. Jumping, trusting the light of the Creator like nothing. I have no idea how it's going to happen. I know it's going to be great. When you reach that place, 
it's totally quiet. Silence. Why is it silence? That it says that God will fight for you. You just keep silent. When we are being attacked, verbally, physically, whatever, you get a letter, you get this, somebody calls you, there, there's so many ways we feel threatened. We have a, th a thought. All of this it arouses what? Usually it arouses negative emotions of negativity, of victimization, of poor me, or or you try, you know, sometimes the biggest uh, protection is to attack, right? The biggest defense is offense, okay? So you just go, but it, it's all about conditioning. Don't you want to break the vicious cycle? Don't you want to go to somewhere you've never been before? Why it keeps coming and repeating again and again? The abuse, the fear, the hysteria, the all of these conditions that really are our own real Egypt. The secret is, you look at it and you say, this is my Pharaoh. This is my private Egypt. And I have to get out of it. And how do I get out of it? It's by shutting it down. But if you shut it down, it, it will kill you finally. Because you are suppressing it. When you're restricting yourself, you're in suppression. When you're in suppression, you finally explode. Either you explode outwardly or you by rage or all kinds of stuff that you lose control or you explode inwardly as a disease. Heart attack, blood condition, all kinds of cancer stuff like this. Ulcer. You can't hold it. You cannot suppress it. You cannot restrict it. You have simply to leap above, high and above it. That's called making a miracle. What's making a miracle? It's to do something outside of nature. Yes, my nature is to be a subject to the fear, the lust, the excitement, the, the addiction, all kinds of stuff like this. This is, this is my Egypt. And I want finally to get rid of it. I want out of it. I don't want that movie all over again. How do you do that? You need to shut it down and immediately making that leap. What is making that leap? Talk to the children of Israel and tell them to travel. Travel where? Upwards. What is a ness? In Hebrew, the word ness means to flee. Lanus. And ness means also in Hebrew, a banner. Somebody that is being raised up and above. So ness does not mean a miracle. It means fleeing, running away, uh, traveling up, high, and above. That's what America. Whenever we go through any kind of trouble, pressure, misery that raises all our shortcomings into our face, it's a setup. It's a setup of the Creator setting us and our Pharaoh face to face and forcing us to fight. Why? So we can finally, maybe one round, second round, third round, maybe one round, we will finally make the miracle and set ourselves free. You cannot have the Creator setting you free. Why? It says, what are you yelling at me? And then he continues and says to Moses, okay, the next verse, verse 17. And now raise your hand. Take your staff. Tilt it on the sea. Split it. So who split the Red Sea? Moses. Who's supposed to split my own Red Sea and release myself from my own Egypt? Myself. Who? Where should I get the power to do that? From the inner light of the Creator but I'm supposed to do it by myself. If you don't do it by yourself, somebody saves you from that, remember, another round will happen. 
Why? Because you didn't achieve that freedom by yourself. You did not create that miracle on your own. It's all a setup. Pharaoh is being set up. The Israelites were set up. Everything is set up. And the purpose was always, and is always good. And if you don't realize that, that there's one thing. I'm stressed out. I'm upset. I'm in a hard place. I'm between the, the, uh, the hammer and the hard place. It's because I need to create a miracle. If I'm going to be hateful towards the hammer or to the, towards the hard place, it sounds silly, right? Nothing there. There's only one thing. The ability of a human being to create a miracle. Because there's nothing that is more important. That is the main story of life, which is the relationship between a person and the light of the creator. Except from that, there's nothing. There's no other stories. All the other stories are just a fake cover stories. Even Pharaoh was run by the light. He was sent over there. Pharaoh, why, God, why can't you split the Red Sea without us threatening us so much? The, our nature is if we're not put in the hard place under the hammer, we don't create miracles. We have the tendency to sit back, to sit back and say, you know what? We're not going to die. It's not so painful. Okay, let's stay here. Let's stay here. That threat got the best out of us. And we know the necessity is the mother of all invent, inv uh, uh, invention. We had to reinvent our minds. And God cannot give it to us. We have to acquire it by ourselves. We acquired it. Because on one hand, we had no other choice. On the other hand, we were prepped up to it. We were being, we've been prepared for it. And that's what's special about it. Everything we go through has a meaning. Nothing is for the bad. If we just get upset, what happens to our IQ? What happens to our ability to deal with it? Nothing. We get, we're under pressure. We have to leap up and above. Create a miracle. When you get up and above, you will know what to do, how to act, why, and how. You'll be a different person. Why? Because you gave birth to the new you. And that's why it says, God will fight for you when you keep silent. What do you mean keep silent? When we shut down all the cry out and the thoughts of victimization and anger, you know, everybody knows the terrible screams and chattering that we have inside our mind and our heart when we are in, under pressure. The moment we have so much noise inside, can we hear the message of the Creator? Go right, go left, do that, say that. Can we hear? He's always sending the message. He's always sending the best, highest quality message of how to get up and above. In order to listen to the message, you have to quiet down the noise. Quiet down the chattering. Quiet down all this thought that I know, I know, you know, I'm this and that. Shut it down just for a second and let it in. Let go and let God. That's what this parasha is about. The moment we did it, the moment we created that moment, because we didn't have any choice. We had a whole army behind us. We had a sea in front of us. And Moses put his hand and staff on the sea, and the sea was split. Did everybody see the sea split? No. No? Moses said, the, split, the, the sea is split. You can go now. Nobody saw it. So Nachshon, Ben Aminadav, the head of the tribe of Judah, said, if Moses said the sea is split, if God said the sea is split, I know it's split. So let's go forward. And he jumped into the sea. You know what? When he jumped into the sea, everybody jumped after him. Because, you know, we know it's split. We don't believe our eyes. We don't believe our ears. We don't believe our senses. It has to be because there's no way 
that the Creator will throw us to the dogs. No way. We cannot relinquish our life and our power to the darkness. It has to be like this. We have to go forward and it will go forward. And as they go in and they went up to here, straight forward, the sea was split. So who split the sea? Moses and the children of Israel that agreed that the sea split and with their faith, they made it happen. Now you understand why a whole nation had a prophetic experience of seeing more than believing. Seeing, not with the eyes, not with the ears, but also with the eyes and the ears. But first of all, they saw it in their hearts, their minds, with all, with every cell of their body, they saw it, experienced it. Otherwise, they won't be able to walk into the sea without drowning. You know, some people try to say that it was a low tide. Only people who never been to the Red Sea can say that. The Red Sea is a rift. It's a crack in the, uh, in the uh, earth. If it was dried, there were walls, tens of meters tall, if not hundreds of meters tall, covered with corals. That's how the Red Sea is structured. They will just fall and break everything if that was a low tide of hundreds of feet. It's like impossible. There's no way if you know what the Red Sea is about. They had to walk through the sea in a dimension that is not recognized by science. So don't try to, to prove it through science. That's nonsense. It was another dimension. It's a dimension that we created through faith, through creating a miracle, doing something we never could do before, knowing if I quiet down the me, 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 me noise, the uh, what's going to happen noise, they, it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong, they're going to kill us. You quiet down and you just connect to one thing, the most quiet place in the universe, the moment of creation, the endless love that extended from the Creator Himself, that contains everything, everything, everything that anyone could ever need, forever. When you connect to that place, only through that quietness, when you shut down the negativity and you just let it in, it will come in. How, what form is going to take, you never know. It's going to take the form you need. Then when you get it, you know, because when you get it, you will be there. You will be there and you say, why, where was I? That was horrible. Where am I? That's amazing. That's seeing everything in a different light. That is what the Spitting the Red Sea is about. How do we connect to it? So, let's go. Another few verses. Verse 19. Verse 19, 20, and 21 have exactly 72 letters each. When you compose them together, you get what is called the 72 names of God. It says that they were inscribed on Moses' staff. They describe the splitting of the Red Sea. But what it is about, when you need to make that hop, when you need to make that quantum leap, and you feel the noise, and you don't know how to shut it down, you don't know how to make that leap, you need help. The whole Torah is a help. As we said in previous... Uh, in previous Parashot, the whole Torah is about the names of God that if you let them in, they will help you to make the leap. But nothing like the 72 names of God. That's why the, the sages say that by scanning the 72 names from right to left, all of these names, 
you just again and again and again trying to shut down the noise to shut down the logic to shut down the pain the misery and so on knowing this is all illusion illusion of chaos when you connect to the real true light you don't care anymore how it's going to look like the next stage but you know it's going to be okay this is when you've reached that place of total quietness this is the moment of the leap this is the moment of the leap of faith that gives you a leap of life it gives you a new movie a new life a new direction a new logic a new consciousness and a higher level of trusting the light, the creator, justice, hope, positivity, love, you just name it. Trusting what is good. And that's when you start singing. That's when you start singing because when you reach that place, this place is called, you have the, the Kabbalists are saying, the four levels of communication when you're talking about the words. The lowest level, Malchut, is the level that is the letters, just the shape of the letters, the vessels. A higher level, Zeranpin, second level from the bottom. These are the crowns on the letters. It's like the, uh, you know, when something falls into the water and you have fast, speedy picture and you see those crowns coming out, that's the result of the inscribing of the letters. The higher level, third level, Bina, number three from the bottom, these are the vowels, neshama. Without the vowels, the letters are dead. But one level above, these are the melodies. The melodies, the music. That's chokhmah. Chokhmah, if you go also, there are numbers to each one of these levels. The bottom level, malchut, the number for it is, 40, is 52. The code number for the second level, the alpin, is 52. The code level for the third level, Bina, is 63. The code for the fourth level, Chochma, is 72. 72 names of God. But more than that, we spoke about it last week, about putting the letters, Yud, inside Pharaoh. It's also in this parasha. After the splitting of the Red Sea, Everybody was flying. Everybody was singing together. Everybody was rejoicing. It's like, you know, when you connect to that illumination, you don't have to force yourself to be happy or to rejoice. It just flows out of you naturally. You just think. However, there was another test. After leaving the Red Sea, the Torah in this parasha, He's saying they're coming to a place they didn't have water, and they're coming to a place with bitter water. The place was called Mara, bitterness. And we know the secret is to be a human being is the ability to transform bitterness into sweet. That's what it is. That's what being human is about. Vailon I'm reading verse 24, chapter 15. Vailon everybody complains on Moses. What are we going to drink? Vayitzak el Hashem, and Moses screams and yells to God. Vayoreh Hashem etz, and God shows him a tree. What tree? The tree of life. Vayashlech el amayim, and he throws the tree into the water. Vayintekhu amayim, and the water becomes sweet. When we, you connect to the tree of life, everything becomes sweet. Whatever looked just a second ago, bitter miserable hopeless the moment you connect to the tree of life consciousness everything turns sweet and what if it's still bitter you didn't connect to the tree of life dial again and then verse 26 we spoke about it last week and god says if you will hear the, the name of god your creator and you follow his precepts, you observe all his rules, all the 
all the disease that I put on Egypt, I will never put on you because I'm God, your healer. And Rabbi Isaac Lurie is saying, if you take the name of God and you, the name, we spoke about the level of Chokhmah, the highest level, when you spell it out in that level of Chokhmah, is you write Yud, it's Yud, Vav, Dalit. You say Yud, you hear three letters, right? Yud, Vav, Dalit. Hey, Hey and Yud. Vav, Vav, Yud and Vav. Hey, it's Hey and Yud. When you have that, the numerical value for that is 72. And you have in that name of God, four times Yud. Says Rabbi Ezekluria, it's a segula. It's a, it's a medication. Every morning after the morning prayers, say this verse. And when you say this verse, as you come to the words, Alecha, Ki Ani Hashem, concentrated in the word Alecha, there's a Yud, Ki, there's a Yud, Ani, there's a Yud, Hashem, there's a Yud. These four Yuds, put them inside your Pharaoh, put them inside your heart. Put them inside your fear, your anger, your upset, and bring the light of the Creator in. That will help you silence the chattering, the negativity, the darkness, and then you can skid, lift up the quantum leap and achieve the miracle. When you do that, you will sing. You will feel that song. You will connect to that place that melody is coming from this high place, especially a melody of life. Thank you so much, and have a great, great week. Shavuot Tov.